So our next panel uh, is going to look a little deeper at the issues that were raised by John Podesta and Senator Whitehouse. Uh, the next panel, State of the Ocean, is moderated by Dr. Jerry Schubel. Nobody has been working at the intersection, at the confluence of management, policy, communications, and science more than Dr. Schubel has over his career. Currently CEO and President of the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, uh, President Emeritus at New England Aquarium, uh, a very long bio that you could read in your program. Uh, it's a great honor for us to welcome back to Chow, Dr. Jerry Schubel. Thank you very much, Jason. We should have a, a slide, but it's hard for, I can't see the monitors from here, although I can up there. For those of you who are right in the front, you may have trouble seeing these monitors. No, okay, we're in good shape. All right, this is the state of the ocean panel, and we're going to also take a, make a, an attempt to assess how much of what we already know we are using. We've heard two very informative and inspiring talks, and now we want to dive more deeply. Our panelists, we have a wonderful group of panelists. David Conover, who is the Interim VP for Research at Stony Brook University. He's the former director of the Division of Ocean Sciences at NSF, former co-chair of the Subcommittee on Ocean Science and Technology. Sitting next to him, Margaret Davidson, who is the senior leader for coastal inundation and resilience at NOAA. She is the former acting director of the Office of Ocean and Coastal Resource Management, and also of, she was the director of NOAA's Coastal Services Center. Scott Doney is the director of the Ocean and Climate Change Institute at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And sitting next to him is Tony McDonald, the director of the Urban Ocean Institute, Monmouth University, and he was the former executive director of the Coastal States Organization. Four very impressive people, four people who play quite different but complementary roles in the ocean. The ocean is changing. We've heard that from uh, Mr. Podesta and certainly from Senator Whitehouse. It's getting warmer and more acidic. We're losing biodiversity, we're losing fish stocks, and sea level is rising and coral reefs are in jeopardy. Human expectations for the ocean are changing. I think most experts believe that as we go forward, we will look to the ocean for more food, more energy, both renewable and non-renewable, more minerals, more recreational opportunities, more shipping, and more fresh water. Just within the last week, a city in California indicated that it believes it needs to build an ocean desal plant. And human relationships with the ocean are changing, particularly for those people who live along the coastline. We've heard that 39% of the population lives there, and they are very vulnerable to uh, a rising sea level. I don't know whether you can read the caption here, but implementing these changes won't be easy. We're pretty set in doing things the wrong way. This is a good follow-up to the comments that we just heard. I'm not so sure that it's doing things the wrong way, but maybe we should shift our emphasis and do it now. This is a, a schematic that I feel, feel quite strongly about. We refer to it as the ocean knowledge value curve. Down at the lower left, you have data, moving up the curve, information, knowledge, wisdom, and action. All of these are quite different. Information is not the same as data. The two quotes that, to distinguish the two that I think are most informative, the late Nobel laureate Peter Medawar said that information is data that has been configured to answer a question or to deliver a message. And Peter Drucker, the late management guru, said that information is data endowed with relevance and purpose. Knowledge is quite different from information, and so is wisdom. Knowledge often it means taking things apart to understand how they all fit together. Wisdom is putting them back together and making decisions that preserves the whole. Some of you may remember in T.S. Eliot's Little Gidding and Four Quartets, there are a wonderful couple of phrases that when he said, where is the wisdom 
we have lost in knowledge. And where is the knowledge we have lost in information? He didn't say it, but we very easily could have said, he could have easily said, where is the information that we have lost in data? We have increasing amounts of, of data. Data are at the base of this chain. But unless you drive the discussions up that chain through information, knowledge, wisdom, take action, we haven't accomplished very much. So I want to start by asking our panelists, when, when you look at, at uh, this, where, where does this system break down? We've heard from two people this morning that the system isn't always working. What can we do to reduce the frequency and the impact of the breakdowns of this system? Knowing more is not enough. I'm going to start with Margaret Davidson. Margaret? What? <laughs> Go for it. Ah. Well, you didn't tell me I got to be the first at bat. Uh, but I would say that I think the systematic failure lies between information and knowledge. Uh, we, we push a lot of information out there. We don't always translate it into things that inform our worldview and how we think about our decision processes. So it's breaking down more between information and knowledge. David, where would, what would you say? Where, where you've just finished uh, a term at NSF, where do you see the breakdown? Um, uh, I see part of the breakdown in the difficulty in, in, in communicating what we um, learn from data, translated into information, which can grow knowledge. Uh, but then it's, uh, we, we, we're still challenged with uh, communicating that knowledge in terms that can actually inform wisdom and action, ultimately. And part of the disconnect is that um, the individuals that are at the lower part of those curves, many of them are scientists at universities throughout the nation. Uh, and uh, many of those individuals, I th the, the tide is changing, uh, I think, in terms of scientists being more willing to enter the public arena, not, be, not just be settled, uh, satisfied with publishing their data in a scientific journal, but actually pushing the next step. Um, Jane Lubchenco is here, has created a program called the Leopold Fellows Program that helps scientists do that. At Stony Brook, we've created a, the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science to empower scientists to help make that connection. Uh, and I think uh, there are more and more scientists willing. And we need a university system that rewards them for doing so, which we don't have right now. Yes. Tony? Um, I, I guess I'm going to suggest two things. First of all, I think we actually uh, break down more when you add the factor of change into the equation, that the reality is this is a changing environment. So the, relationship between data, information, wisdom, and action actually change fundamentally depending on time scales and, and questions that you're asked. So in a changing system, I think this breaks down because people want to have a linear way of moving up this chain, and I don't think that actually plays out in reality. And my other general comment, and I made this to you, we, we, with this, I feel like this is like the upside down food chain. I actually think it should be the other way, where we should value the data and information in, in ways that actually are more fundamental um, to action than this sort of um, graphic sort of suggests. So I think sometimes this suggests and gives the power to the decision makers in a way that I think allows them to disregard information the way some of this is set up. Well, we may, we'll come back to that, because I, I would disagree with you. Scott, what would you add to this? Well, I, I, actually, I was going to agree with Tony. Tony gets my points. <laughs> but, uh, you know, one of the problems is right now is that the, sci the, the scientific community decides what are the important problems. And your diagram is a one-way diagram. You know, we collect data, and it goes up the chain. I, I think, particularly when we're talking about impacts and solutions, we need to engage the stakeholders as not only at the end, not in the communication side, but how we frame the science problems, what we observe, what the science problems we want to look at. And, and certainly I would agree with that, and that was what uh, Senator Whitehouse said, talking about uh, the, the ring that surrounds the, the Capitol. Somebody's got to get in the moat and kill the alligators. Mm -hmm. but, uh, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but on the other hand, it does start data, information, knowledge, wisdom, action. I would have, I, I think that if Senator Whitehouse were here, he would say that it breaks down in, their, in the wisdom and action place. A lot of these things, the decisions can be made only by government. Right. Margaret, you're a, you've been one of them for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's why I think the breakdown actually occurs before that, because I think the public sector is actually often too late to the party. Uh, I'll give you an example. So I've been involved with coastal management issues for a long time. Uh, it is largely the province of local land use planning and zoning. Uh, when a developer, let's see, hypothetical, when a developer has decided, or the Chamber of Commerce has decided on the preferred development site at a cocktail party or at a golf game, they go out and buy that piece of property, and they've invested money with the uh, bankers and the interest and the lawyers and the engineers even before they come to ask for a permit. So we're left dinking with uh, fighting the battle on the margins. So I think we need an intervention strategy. That's what I'm calling for, so that we're actually working with the people to reshape how they think about things like, for instance, preferred development sites. And so that's why I joke that uh, we push a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of information out there. That doesn't mean that it gets picked up. That doesn't mean that it gets used. It doesn't even mean that it's relevant. So I think uh, the scientists are great. We need discovery. For instance, we wouldn't be listing so many deep sea corals if it wasn't for the ocean exploration program telling us 15 years ago that we actually had some uh, in those spots. And they were just out there looking. Uh, but we also do need uh, things that are from the get-go intended to actually help us advance the ball, very applied. So when you talk about engaging stakeholders, I think we need to engage them not just in the definition of the problem, but even how we think we're going to go out and collect the data. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I, and, and I certainly would agree. I moved away from academia because I believe that the public has to be better informed and be engaged in, in all of these issues. David, you look let, like you Let want. me add something to that. Uh, I think uh, the, the senator was talking about this translation of wisdom to action here in Washington. Right. But I think it's a somewhat different story on, on a regional basis. And I'd like to give you an example. Uh, from Suffolk County, uh, the outer two-thirds of Long Island, where Stonebrook is located, right. the county executive of Suffolk County has declared that the number one problem for the county is nitrogen-based uh, groundwater pollution which is causing harmful algal blooms, um, undermining the productivity of shellfish. Uh, but most importantly, and this relates to the effects of Sandy in this region, is it's, breaking, it's uh, d damaging the marshes, which actually are the nat natural barrier that protect the main parts of the island. So here's a, 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 re a regional politician that actually has made that his way up through the top of that, ready to take action. Uh, and in fact is going to start sewering districts, putting, putting more homes on sewers, and actually changing the kinds of uh, septic and uh, cesspool systems that now are existing on Long Island so we can reduce the nitrogen level. And he's not doing it, I think, purely because he's seen the light, but because he thinks his constituents want to see this happen. Good. So uh, I think you can see lots of examples probably on regional scales where that translation is, is happening. And, and I think that's a very good point. We'll come back to that yeah. later, because I think we have to highlight some of these success stories. Uh, people are getting tired of, of talking only about threats. They're looking for opportunities and success stories. But uh, to me, when I look at this curve, the, the data information and maybe halfway up to knowledge, or maybe sometimes all the way up to knowledge, that's the domain of, of research and researchers. And, and the, the place where we still break down, without ascribing any blame to anyone, is in the wisdom to action at the national level. Anybody disagree with that? Not at the regional, not at the local, at the national level. I only disagree to the extent that we look to the national level to make those actions. I think increasingly that is changing. So I actually do think that the reality of the national level action as being the driver uh, I think not only by inaction, but I think by deliberate choice, we're getting uh, federal agencies telling us we actually are not in the action business. And I actually think increasingly you're seeing the NGO sector, yes. the private philanthropy sector yes. in research and action, and I'm a state and local guy, that's really my right. background, um, that has been, we've been moving at that, in that direction for a while. But I actually do think, I'm only disagreeing with to the point I actually think what's happening is we actually do have an opportunity um, to look at different actors than perhaps we tend to when we come into DC for Capitol Hill Ocean Week. And, and I think that's a good point. Part, partly maybe it's because of the frustration on our part uh, with the lack of, of action, because there still are some things only government can do. If you, if you can't read the caption, 
It says, your proposal is innovative. All of you have innovative ideas. Unfortunately, we'll, we won't be able to use it because we've never tried something like this before. <laughs> that sounds like government to me. <laughs> Margaret. <laughs> Margaret. <laughs> Don't take that drink. You, you've been one of them a long time. Uh, well, I think. Uh, 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 Saying that. <laughs> yes, I are part of the problem, Pogo. Uh, I, I think it's kind of like that thing that sometimes has been erroneously attributed to Einstein and falsely misquoted, so I will continue that tradition. Uh, that his definition of insanity was doing things the same way and expecting a different result. So uh, I think it is the nature in particular of Fedlandia, but I won't just leave it uh, with the feds, but I think it is the nature of Fedlandia to be inherently conservative. It, it, it is inherent in the federal papers that we are uh, conservative, particularly in this part of the government. Uh, I think most of the people who come into the federal government uh, find their comfort zone somewhere between 10 to 15 years and find it difficult to consider uh, new grounds. So I think that's a challenge. A and we have so many processes that are set up to address the one bad uh, apple in the barrel. So, so everything is geared to the lowest possible uh, common denominator, and that does not spark innovation. I don't think we were set up to be innovative, frankly. That's why I think that uh, the cultural shift that Tony talked about, in which we recognize uh, the distinct roles of many people across different levels of scale, across many different sectors even, because I do think there's an increasing role not just for the NGO community but for the private sector. Uh, I think that's a really great thing. Uh, and, but we all need to learn a lot more about the importance of boundary organizations and how do we facilitate and enable and empower people to step up. But if the federal government wasn't set up to innovate, wasn't, that, wasn't it at least set up to nurture innovation, to allow it to happen? And are we well, doing that? David, you, I've heard that criticism. That was supposed to be what our science enterprise oh, was but, about. But, and I, I've heard that with NSF. I think I left government just in time. It's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to fund high-risk research. Yeah. And often it's because of the reviewers and the review process. What's your comment on that? Uh, yes, it, it can be very difficult to uh, fund the extremely novel ideas that are so um, uh, uh, opposed to the conventional point of view that very few people agree with them. So uh, that is a problem that not only NSF, but the community that we use to peer review proposals, we have that, pro that, we have that problem in common. And I think uh, what this reflects, and to take a little flack off government, is that um, the scientific community uh, isn't very transformative either, with the way they think about big problems. Uh, one idea at a time, yes. But we need to transform the way we fund science and the ratio of things like how much we invest in facilities versus people, uh, and, uh, and come up with a new business model for how we fund research going forward in the future. We're going to come back to that. Scott, would you like to add, add a thought to that? Yeah, I, I, I think one of the problems is we, in the end, we need to make connections to people in coastal communities. They need to understand how climate change or overfishing is affecting them personally. And we can't just continue doing natural science the way we've done it and try to communicate yeah. it. I think part of the problem is we don't have enough information on how this does actually affect people and how we can get them to re relate to their everyday experience. So we need more social scientists. I, I, to I, Tony and then Mark. But it's not only social science. I think that's an element of it. But I guess two observations. Back to the original question. That slide to me is really about inertia. And I think inertia is, the scientists will tell me, is something actually real and scientific. And I think it exists differently in universities, mm -hmm. moving from PIs to investigative. It, it exists in government for a variety of different reasons. Some of those reasons aren't necessarily bad. So I think there's that aspect of inertia, but you need to understand where the different groups come into the equation. I also, though, think, to Scott's point, that this is kind of what I call a little bit the sort of IMAX film problem we have right now in the ocean, which is either you have these beautiful films of fantastic abundance and wonderfulness or disaster films. The space that Scott <laughs> wants to get to where people and places connect to problems right. is not something that we do a very good job of either researching 
in a consistent, ongoing way. Margaret and I come from a little bit of the brown water background. You know, people still don't like the coast. It's still <laughs> messy, the estuaries, you know? The, you, you mentioned the nitrogen issue. I'm sorry, but uh, we were at Airly, whatever that was, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and the same list of needs is out there. So I would suggest that it's in that middle range where people exist and problems exist that perhaps we needed a better job, not only in the research, but in then translating that um, to people and getting them involved. Margaret. But Jerry, it's not just the shortfall of, of the public sector. It's not just the shortfall of the universities, because I think there's a larger systemic problem here. That is, particularly in this country, but not unique to this country, just especially so, we are actually disinvesting in science. See, in the private sector, uh, Skunk Works, IBM Lab, we could name a, a handful of those things. All those uh, areas of capabilities have also uh, deteriorated in the last 10 to 20 years. Uh, in the UK, they tore down their science enterprise uh, a few years back, some woman named Thatcher, and they've actually just spent the last 30 years rebuilding it. Uh, and they're tearing it down and reconstructing it again in Australia. I mean, denialism isn't just limited to climate science. Right. It's actually our anti-intellectual roots in this country that we need to address. All right, we're going to come back to that. I've, I've been said we told we should announce that we will be going to 1210 um, because we got a late start. So don't flee the room, please, at 12 o'clock. <laughs> and I have a number of questions that we will get to. But let's take a look. Th this is a figure. The Ocean X Prize had a meeting about two weeks ago. And there were 35 people there. And if you look at on the, the now, the ocean was characterized as being unhealthy, overlooked, and a mystery. And the idea was to, in the future, we would like to have the ocean healthy, valued, and understood. And the question is, how do you get from what we have now to the future? And it's interesting that uh, both of our speakers this morning talked about the importance of awareness. And uh, I invite each of you to give me one idea of how to get from now to the future and to make a difference in the next, say, in the next decade or so. In, either, in any of those or all of those categories, who'd like to start? Well, I'll, Scott. I'll, I'll start. One of the things we're trying to do is really engage people in the science. You know, that science is not some external force that comes in and collects data. So we're trying to work with the fishing communities, with coastal communities, where they're actually collecting the observations involved in the interpretation, and then they're drawing their own conclusions about what action needs to be made. So partnerships, and included in that, might be citizen science, but wouldn't, if that yeah. wouldn't have to be. Who has another one? David? I would flip that as well and, 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 and reemphasize that it's equally important that we have scientist citizens that scientists themselves recognize they have a civic responsibility to do more than just do their research and put it in a journal. It's, so it's the flip side of what uh, Scott was just talking about. Those two, that's where we can meet in the middle between citizens that want to actually engage in scientists and scientists that want to engage in citizen uh, activities, not just those citizens themselves, but in translating the science they do into forms that can make it useful for policymaking. Tony? I guess I, I, I'm the maybe contrarian on the panel, but I, I feel like we have to say right now, the future is now. What do people perceive that is healthy, valued, and understood about the ocean? And how do we build on that based on a different future, not a backward looking, right. how do we correct those problems? So to me, the future's now, and then how do, we, how do we want it to be in the future? And that way you're really generating sort of a really positive agenda based on people's already, um, I think, there is a high value. You, the polling all sort of suggests that people do value the ocean, um, but that's not translating into the types of actions that I think we're looking for. Remember, Will and Ariel Durant, the historian, said the future never just happened, it was created. And we will create the future. Even e We will either do it thoughtfully and purposefully, or we will do it unintentionally. Margaret. So uh, this is a little more pedestrian. Uh, NOAA has the unique privilege among mission agencies to be located in something called the Department of Commerce, which is so appreciative of resource mission requirements. I'm uh, just but, looking over here. The secretary has left, the former secretary. But, but so you're safe. The, one of the things that does happen at the Department of Commerce that uh, everyone seems to hang with bated breath waiting for is leading economic indicators. So it's only taken us 15 years, but now NOAA 
is working with the right people in the Department of Commerce to come up with a leading ocean economic indicator. Now, I, I think there are challenges when you try to distill that down into a, a single economic number, but the reality of life is until we, uh, inside this capitalist system that we have, until we have a number that's a leading economic indicator to go along with all those other numbers that are so important to all the capitalists, then, then it will never be sufficiently valued by the big decision makers, which is a different issue than how do we value it as individuals and citizens and people who have to breathe. But uh, I think you have to do both the macro as well as the personal value issues. All right, anybody else have an idea of how to move from now to uh, the future? All right, we'll leave it at that. But I think to, to a first order approximation at least, uh, mystery to understood, that's a domain of research, but it also extends over into education, translating data into information and knowledge. In, in the uh, education clearly is what's important in, in this idea that it's overlooked and to it yes. being valued and it's public education and it's, it isn't just uh, university and colleges, it's not even just K to 12. It's lifelong learning and public education. And at the top, it is action. Now, it doesn't always have to be at the federal level. It can be at the regional level, and it can be at the local level, but it does take action. All right, here's one of my favorite cartoons. And you heard uh, Senator Whitehouse. We came out of the ocean. We're all, or, or they were, I guess, quoting, quoting uh, Bill Clinton. And we did. We've evolved. Um, and look what we've evolved to. Um, so this is a cartoon that caption says, they give you a lot of treats while they're training you. So play dumb for as long as you can. <laughs> now, do we sometimes, if not play dumb, um, do we talk about too much about disasters and not enough about opportunities? Are we following this cartoon? Margaret, have you played uh, dumb well, these, all it, these years? It, it is a natural. <laughs> I'm happy to play dumb for you. Uh, it, it is a natural instinct to try and use whatever moment. The scientists refer to disasters as galvanic opportunities. And sometimes during crisis, we actually do move the needle. Uh, but that has actually fallen off in recent years. A and the thing we know about most people, particularly younger people, is, is that stories of possibilities sell so much better than Chicken Little. So I think, I think we have to be mindful of reality, but we also have to give people the light over the horizon, else why are they going to run towards it? Anybody want to add anything to that? That's the what everybody well, tells us about stories and myth making and Joseph Campbell and the power of myth. You can drag people well, down to the depths of despair, but at the end, you've got to give them some hope. Well, it preceded Joseph Campbell. Well, there was it, this little guy called Homer. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> and it probably even preceded uh, your friend Homer, you, uh, you, who you but went you, to high school with. But go ahead, Scott. But, <laughs> Jerry, I think there, there are some good examples. You know, we, we talked this morning about issues of ocean acidification occurring in the Pacific Northwest. What wasn't mentioned is that the, the hatcheries have been working with scientists coming up with solutions using observations and changing what they're doing, adapting to climate change. And I think that's, that's one of the messages, is we need to come up with solutions where we can adapt to a changing environment and learn as we go along. And that's a great example because of scientists working with the shellfish growers, changing the times when they pumped so that because the pH changed over the, the course of a day and they changed the times that they pumped and the, the mortality of larvae went way down. Who, who else would like to make a, a comment well, here? I, I think that a, a couple of things. I, I do think that um, implicit in this slide as well is the reality is we do create a, sort of a, a system that reinforces self-interest. So researchers like what they got and want more of what they got, even though they know maybe they should change. <laughs> Programs know that perhaps they're not addressing tomorrow's priorities, but they don't know how to go there. Getting, creating that safe space to be flexible in order to be strategic, not necessarily transformational, although you also want that transformational change at the same time, I think is a real critical issue that doesn't get discussed enough and it's not enabled because I do think the current systems at the academic research side, at the governmental side, tend to reinforce self-interest, and that's okay. I, I, I'm a small player in this big ocean research game here, but 
people get very jealous when I get a little money. And I'm like, uh, OK, you know, I'm not taking money from you. But I'm not kidding. I mean, it's sure. really insane. I mean, it's just crazy. So I do right. think that that's an aspect of this playing dumb. It's not so much playing dumb as playing like, I, I just, I'm afraid to give up. And I'm going to actually say it's not just governmental. I'm going to bring the private sector as well. I do think the private sector likes to complain about the laws. But better the devil you know. Uh, it's right. very difficult to work sometimes with the private sector to talk about a, a different management regime. We haven't amended environmental laws in 30 years right. because there's no way we can find to have that dialogue between that because even though they want to complain it and, and the senator mentioned about you know, disemboweling EPA, they don't necessarily want to have a, what I would call a balanced dialogue about what the alternative might be right. even though they want it. David? Yeah, I, coming back to this issue of uh, are we uh, uh, proclaiming too much gloom and doom and not providing enough inspiration, I think uh, that's an area where we could actually do a better job, uh, although we're, we're making progress, with collaborating with um, artists and people uh, in the realm of literature, uh, because it's not enough to inform people. Uh, you have to make them care and inspire them that a difference can be made in the future. And, Scientists aren't always the best voice to be, to be used to carry that story, uh, but we can collaborate with those who are good at storytelling and inspiring people to care through art, through literature, uh, and reach more people in that fashion. And we don't do enough of we that. Don't. I would totally agree with you. OK, before we go to the questions from the audience, I'd like each of you just tell us one thing that you would recommend so when Chow takes place next year, things will look better for the ocean, what would be the one thing that we might push hard on as a community for the next 12 months? Who wants to start? Well, since uh, a senator is a big proponent of the National Endowment for the Oceans, uh, I would like to see a, a portion of that mythical fund. Uh, I mean, I hope we actually do get something like that one day, since we are uh, generating, actually, the well stocked for the whole planet. Uh, but I, I'd really like to see something inside of that that's set up f uh, for innovation, not just to fund things we already have. But as Tony alluded, you know, there are no incentives. I, I've been very involved with the prize process inside the federal government. We've been very big on prizes lately. And there's some interesting things that have happened. And I've watched the, the Smith Foundation. I've watched some of the other things happen. But I, I've seen, outside of Elon Musk, I've actually seen very few things that are transformative. And so how do we actually leapfrog, not just do a better job, uh, move incrementally, but uh, since we're stuck in this place, how do we create totally different kinds of incentives uh, inside the public sector, inside academia, with the private sector? How do we actually grow the green economy? I think that's one of our bigger challenges, because if we generate more jobs making a healthy ocean happen, then I guarantee you that a lot of my friends in South Carolina will also be there. Clay Christensen of the Harvard Business School captured that when he said we need disruptive strategies, disruptive technologies, incremental change doesn't work. Exactly. It's through these disruptive strategies. Anybody want to add to this before we go? Well, let's see. I want one, yeah, one idea. Uh, one of the things I think is very important for us to do in the next 12 to 24 months is to, is to support the national ocean policy. And that's not just because I helped work on that, uh, but because, and it may have flaws. It may not be as bold as we wish, as we wish it were. Uh, but it is our national ocean policy. It is a platform through which science can be translated into policy. And it's very important, I think, that um, it have enough legs and have demonstrated enough success and support so that when we go to the next administration, the new administration will embrace it. I think um, it's a wonderful platform. Uh, we wish we had a national climate policy, but at least we have a national ocean policy. And I think. Um, Continuing to support that, uh, even though it's not perfect, is really important over the next several months so that it lasts. And coastal and marine, or just marine spatial planning, is an important yes. part of that, I think, that can take advantage of the, the data, the information, the knowledge we have, and make better decisions. Scott? Well, a little bit smaller, but I want to follow up on what Dave's point was that we need to change the culture of how we train academic scientists, research scientists. So maybe one of the things we could do is have you know, at this meeting, where are the future leaders of ocean research? Where are the graduate students, the postdocs? You know, we need to engage them now, not when they're 
20 or 30 years into their career. Uh -huh. But then I think that goes back to a point Dave, David made earlier. We have to change the rewards structure then in universities to acknowledge the legitimacy but and if, the but importance. But if, if you engage them now, they're going to be the ones that are going to change. You know, I agree. Dave's not going to change the world, but maybe they <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, neither are you, Scott. Uh, but, but I do think the, the new generation, uh, the, the, the young faculty that I hired while I was dean there, that is actually, those people are empowered, they're engaged, they're enthusiastic about actually addressing these problems. And I think it is, it is the younger members of the scientific community that will be the ones that carry uh, all these um, initiatives forward. All right. Tony, you I, get the last word. I, I, I have a kind of a crazy dream here, but in the face of what I perceive to be the inevitable um, increased use of the ocean, ports, um, offshore wind, oil and gas uh, activity, there's going to be more um, regardless of, of where you stand on the issues. Uh, I had this crazy idea where at some point the fish, the fishermen, and the habitat resilience have the foundation. The scientists have given the three of them, those groups, an ability to sit here and say, we have a, 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 a foundational claim on the ocean, and we, the scientists can help us explain that in ways that aren't just in terms of magnus and fisheries debates, uh, but in terms of a broader need for um, ecosystem resilience. Good. All, all good points. All right, we're going to take some questions from the audience. This one is directed at me, and the question is, is having a moderator that makes blatantly anti-government, sexist, and, <laughs> and um, Thank you, Sandra. ageist yeah. comments a helpful way to create productive conversation? <laughs> I, 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 I ask you, Margaret. <laughs> Ecosystems uh, have a lot of diversity. We have to put up with many <laughs> archetypes. And, and they tend to, and productive, healthy ecosystems tend to be quite resilient. This is a very resilient panel. S systems that turn over regularly are the most resilient. <laughs> All right, the, ne the, the next one was Fedlandia and the Peter Principle. Have we risen to the level of our own incompetence? Who would like to address that? Well, I think we rise to the level of expectations. I think that's true for every segment of society. <laughs> and if the expectations for uh, the federal government are what they seem to be, uh, then I think we can meet those expectations. And that's the tragedy. OK, anybody want to add well, to that, I, Scott? I, 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 let's talk positive for a moment. OK. You know, I think Dave's, <laughs> good a, for you. Dave's a good example of a Surviving. stellar research scientist who has come to DC and spent time here and tried to make a difference. And I think that's something we, we need to do is engage the academic community yes. in, in the functioning of the science enterprise and the science policy enterprise. And there are very few people who are willing to do that. It, that uh, cultural uh, thing is very important. I'll add to the positive tone, too. I also think, you know, I, I've been in the business about 20 years, but it's transformational now the way we can represent and show science, um, yeah. the power of modeling, the power of ecosystem understanding. You know, 10 years ago, wow, we can't do ecosystem. Yes, you can. We can actually do things in ways that really are really potentially transformational. So I do think the tools and the data integration and some of that work is really, we are at a point where actually Folks like me who are more on the policy side can actually uh, work with the scientists, I think, and engage the public in a more effective way. All right. If, if I could add just one thing to that, which is uh, if there's one area where I think um, incompetence might be deserved, it's that we don't do a good job of speaking with one voice throughout the ocean science community. Not ju just within the academic community, uh, there's a challenge, and that's what I observed in, uh, during my role at, at NSF. But also, it's, it's broader than that. It involves uh, the academic community, the NGO community, uh, the industry partners that we have, all, the, all of us that are stakeholders in the ocean have to be able to come together and speak with one voice. And if we can do that, it's far more powerful. And uh, other communities have done it better yeah. than the yeah. oceanographic right. community. Yes. All right. How do we make ongoing ocean issues and science newsworthy? Give me a sound bite, a hook to uh, sell it to the media and the public. How do we make ongoing issues, ocean issues, and science newsworthy? Anybody have a bumper sticker, a sound bite? Oceans are the 401k for life. There you go. That's 401. <laughs> All right. All of you have been bringing up the importance of engagement, translating our science to policy and communication. Any suggestions on where we can gain these skills and who we can reach out to to help us? Who would like to comment on that? 
the importance of engagement, translating science to policy, where can we acquire those skills? So uh, I think we have to start with the, uh, the funnel. Uh, and that, that is the, the really young people, and, and not just inside our schools, because, of course, we've been starving them as well. But for instance, inside things like after school programs, uh, things that the Y runs or other kinds of organizations, I think there are things that we can do to make science more interesting and frankly, less nerdy. Uh, so we have a bigger pool, a more representative pool to begin with, which is still a, a problem even when I look out in this room and I am delighted to see almost half of the room is under 40, so that's a, a great accomplishment, Jason. Uh, but I, I think we have to increase that end of the funnel. Uh, and then I think we have to recognize, uh, to borrow you, uh, we need to spend less time on niche competition and more time on, on understanding niche complementarity uh, as we go. move through the funnel. I, I think I spent a good bit of my time working on community resilience and sea level rise in Sandy in New Jersey, as you might imagine. There's actually some pretty wonderful work going on with regard to access to information that actually funnels down from the federal level um, that actually get to more localized tools and more community-based tools and information. So I do think, again, it is a little bit the state-local framework, but it's the feds as enablers of, of that and, and then allowing the NGO sectors and the academic sectors to engage that. So I think you see, you'll find a lot of really good examples, I think, um, that are really coming into play right now after Sandy around community resilience and sea level rise and climate change. And you have discussions about you know, pretty broad scientific issues at a very uh, local and, and, and I think very uh, transparent level. And we, we saw the importance of social capital after Sandy. We saw so. it in Katrina. When you're trying to rebuild, social capital is very important. Um, at the university level, there are more and more universities that I think are adding um, science communication to part of the, the degree requirements at the graduate level. And there are more and more universities that are now offering um, uh, master's degrees in something called conservation science or ocean conservation, which are not the traditional do a thesis and become a researcher degree, but actually are giving um, students uh, the, the knowledge to be good communicators, to be in the interface between science and journalism, for example. So there are opportunities that are slowly opening up, I think, to get that kind of training. Scott and Jerry, if I just met, you know, the way we train scientists is we train them to be experts on a very narrow field. Um, there were only about five people in the world who could read my, thesis, my doctoral thesis or would care to read my doctoral thesis. <laughs> I think we need to change the way we train people. Yes, yes, we need depth in areas of expertise, but you know, we should be producing students at the undergraduate level, the graduate level, who are comfortable talking about the whole range of ocean science issues, right. not a very narrow topic. Right. Good point. A, a connection to people in coastal communities is not enough. This person's from Arizona. Over 24, 28 states have no coastal access. How do you plan to engage these citizens, support their knowledge of the importance of ocean science? How do we get to the people? Well, first of all, I would like to point out the great inland coast encompasses about another uh, dozen states. Uh, it's, uh, some right. refer to it as the Mississippi River, but it actually does behave like a coast, and I frankly think they should be part of the national uh, coastal management program. But the reality of life is, for instance, uh, the Aquarium of the Americas uh, is in some place like Iowa. Uh, no, Aquarium of the Americas is in, in New, Orleans. New Orleans. No, the, the one that's Mississippi up, River Museum and Aquarium one. is in Dubuque, Iowa. There we go. The one in Iowa. <laughs> that's my point. <laughs> the point is that we are all connected by our watersheds, and our watersheds connect us to the source of water and life. Uh, and, and that we shouldn't leave our thoughts and our actions right there in the brown water strip, that we do, in fact, have to engage people in Warren Buffett's hometown. I mean, that's why people like you are actually useful. <laughs> now, Sorry, I had to get my hand. I want uh, that, that, person, that person who sent the thing insulting me to make a note. <laughs> All right. The, the curve addressing an exclusively rationalistic scientific analysis, um, but they raise the question, rationality alone does not drive decisions or action. We need values, too. How do values fit in to all of this decision making. Who would like to say a word? Scott? Well, I, I think there's a lot of evidence that when you talk to people, the way they interpret what you say is based on their value system. Yes. And yeah. you, know, you can't undermine, you can't attempt to undermine their value system. You have to reach out and try to understand what their value system is. 
and then frame how you're communicating it to, to, to connect with them better. I think that's even true of some climate deniers that with their value system. We may not share that. Go ahead, Tom. But I, I also think, um, this is kind of an odd defense, but uh, I, I actually think laws and regulations reflect our values. We've lost track of the fact that actually uh, laws are not things that are imposed because they don't represent popular will or values or science or information. Right. We may question whether in any given instance it plays that way, but I actually think values is just a slightly broader, it's not just a moralistic concept, it's a value of community, uh, community sense and community principles, and that actually is reflected in governance, and that's probably a fundamental thing that we need to get back to as well as the kind of values that other folks are talking about. So values are determined. They determine who we vote for, the actions that we take. Well, Margaret? you talked about social capital early. Uh, er everything we know about resilience is it is one of the cornerstones uh, for community resilience, however you define that. But the thing about it is you have to always be nurturing and building social capital. That is how you hold that conversation, how you increase the number of people who might identify themselves as being even interested in your ideas. So, so we all have to do that. That's why this scientist as citizen is actually such an important movement. So I want to add one other group. I talked about artists and those in the literature, but I think also those in, the, in religion, in the evangelical community, we can present them with a moral question about don't we have a responsibility to protect the species that exist on Earth? And I think you can, you can actually make a lot of headway uh, with that argument, uh, because I think they, they, uh, there are people that do feel we have a moral responsibility uh, to not allow species to go extinct, for example, how, uh, w with a w while avoiding the issue of, of who created that species in the first place, how it was created. And, and Ed Wilson, it doesn't really matter. The fact is, I think that there's an argument to be made. Ed there. Wilson has made that uh, argument very persuasively, I, I think. Well, well Catherine right. Hayhoe at Texas Tech, Lubbock, Texas, uh, is also an uh, evangelical Christian who's done a amazing missionary work within her own community on the climate issue. All right, we've, we have less than, we have about three minutes left. I want to give each of you a chance to make a closing comment. And be careful what you say, Margaret, about me, about my age. My, All right. <laughs> Everyone wants to go to heaven. No one wants to die. <laughs> but that's the one thing that happens. So I, I, in the short run, <laughs> in the short run, it's only the short run, and we all can need to do the best that we can do to advance this ball, however we can do it. But it's not from our individual rabbit warrens. Dave? Um, I think in closing, I just want to uh, thank the organizers for uh, putting this panel together, and Jerry, for you organizing it. Um, it's been a really a great pleasure. I also want to um, say that uh, it, uh, I, I I, sp I did spend three and a half years in Washington uh, at, the, at the National Science Foundation, but working across all the agencies uh, through the National Ocean Policy, and it's, it's great to actually be back here and see many of my friends in the audience. So uh, I would just like to say thank you for uh, inviting me to be part of this. Scott? Well, I just want to bring it back to the yes, state sir. of the ocean, the topic of our panel. Uh, climate change is happening now. It's not a problem of the future. Tony. Uh, I think with regard to the ocean, I think this is sort of a, a bit, every time we think that it seems obvious to us something should happen and it's not, that means we're not asking the right scientific questions, public policy questions, or other, because obviously um, it's not apparent to those actors. So I do think we always need to question our assumptions about what, if it's obvious to us, if it's not obvious to other people, there's more science that needs to be done and more work that we all have to do together. And I would close with a quote from the humorous P.J. O'Rourke who said, Everybody wants to save the world, but nobody wants to help mom with the dishes. <laughs> and I think all of the people on this panel have been helping with the dishes, and we are all better off for everything they do. Thank you all. <laughs> Tony, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, <darling. laughs> Thank you.